Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. This is part two of our special two-part series with Dr. Samuel Gandhi from the Icon School of Medicine. Sam, again, thanks for joining me. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, so in, in the last show, we, uh, we ran out of time. We were talking about kind of the genetics uh, of Alzheimer's uh, in, in terms of you know, what kind of testing you can do, what kind of prediction you can do. Uh, tell me a little bit more about not only what we can do today, but looking ahead, what are your expectations? The genetics in a particular person will probably determine what medicines they will respond to. But one thing about genetic testing that's worth knowing is it shouldn't be undertaken lightly. Uh, for one thing, if you find out that you have a high-risk gene, that immediately has implications for your siblings and your children, and that may be disruptive. Uh, there's another int uh, important thing as well. Uh, we don't have very good genetic privacy laws, and in fact, there's a, there's a movement to force people to disclose uh, genetic illnesses or genetic risk factors that they have. That's not the case now, uh, but uh, what, we, what we typically do, do now is to separate the genetic uh, tests from, from the main medical record because we can't protect or can't prevent uh, against discrimination against uh, employers or insurers who find out that you have a high risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Why not? Why isn't that information confidential? There, there just isn't the, the, the laws don't cover it. I mean, it's just not. Uh, it's not part of your medical record. Right. That's crazy. Uh, how about the possibility of a, of a vaccine for Alzheimer's? Is that something that we can look to, forward to, or not? So uh, intervention in terms of prevention or uh, treating Alzheimer's is where, we, uh, where, where most of the effort is now. Um, it appears that everything we've tried once symptoms begin everything has failed. Even the medicines that are approved only work in some people and only temporarily ever. They always wear off. So at best, you can delay things for a little while, but ultimately, whatever you're taking ends up not having additional effect. That's right. And the approved medicines don't slow progression. They just help the outward symptoms. The pathology in the brain continues to progress. So the, the, and the pathology is what we're targeting now with our uh, interventions. Now since there were, there were known to be mutations in uh, amyloid, that became the most attractive place to start. Uh, and for the past 25 years, we've been trying methods to lower um, amyloid level. Again, however, we've been until now focusing on people who have symptoms. It's only now with a new study that's ongoing uh, at present, that we're concentrating on people who have positive amyloid scans, but no symptoms. Uh, and the idea then is to hope to lower their amyloid levels with a medicine, either uh, an Im immune therapy or a, a, a pill, uh, so that they never get the, the symptoms. You asked about a vaccine. Uh, so the, the pathology, the amyloid, and the, uh, and the tangles, uh, that's uh, the in, in inside nerve cells, the skeleton that usually uh, holds nerve cells uh, in sort of that, that, that characteristic triangular um, shape. The, the tau tangles. Exactly. That's, that's due to, to collapse of the skeleton of the cell. Uh, so both um, the amyloid and tangles are being targeted with immune therapies. Now, the very first amyloid vaccine had some, some important side effects. In fact, there was a moratorium for many years on any immune therapy. Uh, now we've switched to what's called passive immunotherapy in, in which the antibodies are made in a laboratory and infused monthly, sort of like chemotherapy. But still... Why was there a moratorium? Uh, uh, so the, um, once you vaccinate someone, you can't unvaccinate them. Uh, and about 5% of patients who were in the initial vaccine trial uh, developed a fairly severe uh, inflammation of the brain. Um, the blood vessels around the brain often have amyloid deposits as well, so the, the immune response uh, attacks the, the blood vessels. They become leaky, uh, and people become confused, febrile, uh, and often require hospitalization. That then was, was treated with immune suppression, so it's, it was sort of a uh, complicated matter that wasn't, didn't really lead to a good outcome. And be, until, until it was possible to realize that we can survey for this uh, side effect uh, and stop treatment, uh, that then became the, the norm. But that requires not vaccine, but passive immunotherapy because you have to be able to stop it once you see the side effect coming. That's how trials are done now, and they're fairly safe. So when can we expect to have a vaccine? Well, again, immunotherapy is more likely than a vaccine. 
Um, and the immunotherapy that's being tested now against amyloid we'll know about in about four years, I think. Uh, there are beginning now immune therapies against tau, against tangles. Uh, and that's, they are just starting, so it'll be another decade probably before we know uh, if they work. How about a cure? Uh, cure is unlikely. Uh, prevention is more likely than cure. Why, well, why is a cure unlikely? Uh, by the time we have symptoms, or the, the, by the time our patients have symptoms, they've lost synapses, the nerve uh, connections, and they've lost actual brain substance. Maybe a quarter of the brain is gone. Uh, and that can't be uh, restored, and that's the problem. So treatment, uh, cure is unlikely. Arresting progression, perhaps, but cure is, is not likely. Is it, is it looking far ahead, and, uh, uh, given the fact that we're generating tissue, we're growing organs, I mean, you're looking at a future in the next uh, one or two decades where you're gonna be able to replace so many of your body parts with your own, with body parts made from your own tissue which eliminate rejection issues. Obviously the brain is, is hugely more complex than any other organ. Is it possible that uh, we're going to be able to grow brain tissue or uh, create conditions in the brain where it can, it can expand or we can replace damaged tissue? Uh, perhaps temporarily at the beginning when the problems are just memory um, ch uh, changes, memory d disorders that are con confined to the hippocampus. The problem is the widespread damage in Alzheimer's disease. The, the entire cortex is, is affected. In diseases like Parkinson's and Huntington's, the disease, at least uh, initially, is fairly focal, fairly localized. So that's why transplant implanting tissue there is more promising. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back to talk about what you can do to ward off or at least partially mitigate Alzheimer's. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbour. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbour Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos and tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Welcome back to the show. This is part two of our special two-part series with Dr. Samuel Gandhi of the Icon School of Medicine. So Sam, what, what can an individual do and when should he or she do it in terms of you know, talk about uh, exercise, diet, supplements, stress, uh, any factor that, that you think uh, has an effect. I'd be interested in the significance of what you can do uh, is, and, and uh, the actual impact, or is it a lost cause? So the first thing to realize is that most of the risk factors that we've identified and most of the things that you can, can mitigate occur in midlife. So it's in midlife that uh, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, uh, cause the disease to begin, even though the clinical symptoms may not manifest for 20 years. Uh, hypertension in midlife increases the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Hypertension in late life does not. 
So it's the midlife, it's, you need to be controlling your risk factors in midlife. You don't wait until you have a, a memory disorder. So, so your blood pressure at 40 is more important than your blood pressure at 20? 40 is more important than 70. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'm following that. All right, so what, uh, what can you do? Tell me, or tell me what you recommend. So diet and lifestyle are the things that we recommend uh, the, uh, the most strongly right now. So the Mediterranean diet, uh, it's all already recommended for heart health, uh, it's recommended for brain health as well. That is um, fish, chicken, nuts, that sort of thing, uh, olive oil, not so much in terms of beef and pork. Um, so that, that's a, a standard recommendation. Now all of the things that you think of as being good for your, for your heart are good for reducing your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Obese, controlling your body weight, uh, not being obese, uh, controlling your blood pressure, controlling your blood sugar, uh, diabetes increases the risk by Al for Alzheimer's by about uh, 50%, um, um, or uh, blood pressure. So all those things that you, that you control for your heart are also good for Alzheimer's disease. Most importantly, probably the one thing to do, if I had to give my uh, give one piece of advice, physical exercise. And the minimum is three sessions a week of 30 minutes each session of brisk walking or either weight training. That's the standard that has been reproduced in multiple labs. And that's beneficial in terms of slowing progression. Either, either delaying onset in people who don't have the disease or slowing progression in people who do have the disease. That's another thing to remember is that it's never too late for, for exercise to slow the progression. So uh, wh why, does that, why is exercise beneficial? Is it in terms of circulation in the brain or what? So there's an enormous effort now to understand that because uh, many people would love to have an exercise pill that they could take so they wouldn't have to be bothered with all this uh, exercise stuff. I think there's some that have been for sale for many years, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so circulation is one, is one thing, but the uh, area that's getting the most attention right now is the ability of exercise to stimulate the production of what are, told, are called nerve growth factors. These are uh, small molecules made locally in the brain that nourish brain cells and help keep them alive or help sustain them. Um, there's, a, there's one called nerve, nerve growth factor, another called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, those both are produced uh, during exercise. How about sex in Alzheimer's? Just saw a study um, on, uh, that on sex and uh, increased um, or lowering the risk of Alzheimer's disease in people who have uh, more uh, intercourse. Um, I don't know whether it's the exercise or whether it's actually something about um, uh, you know, the, the endocrinology of, of sex that uh, also uh, contributes. But there was just a study. It was just published within the past week. And what did it conclude? It cuts the risk by about half. That's extraordinary. Yeah. That's a, that's a, I, I'm thinking in terms of brain activity. Right. That, <clears throat> that it would, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of things that really fire up your brain. That certainly is one. Yeah, certainly. Uh, that gives you both physical exercise and the, the brain activity part. So on the, on the brain side, uh, in addition to the physical exercise, mental stimulation. And the, the challenge then becomes what to recommend, uh, how, to, how to reduce that to a prescription the way we've done with, with physical exercise. And that's not really been possible. What I, really, what I usually recommend is that people identify something like playing cards, playing music, doing crossword puzzles, reading, something that they like to do. Because if they don't like to do it, they don't enjoy it, they won't do it. Uh, so the most important thing is to identify something that stimulates you, uh, your, your, your thinking, uh, and uh, do more of that. Finally, socialization. Interacting with other humans also sort of covers the sex part. Um, does stimulate uh, or lower your, lower your risk. People who become withdrawn uh, have an accelerated course. What about <clears throat> supplements? I mean, Americans are crazed. Uh, for supplements, multi-billion dollar industry. What, what can we take or should we take, uh, if anything, that would make a difference? So um, one challenge with supplements is that they're not regulated the way medications are. Uh, there's actually no one that uh, checks what goes into that bottle. Uh, there, there's no federal reg regulation to say that, that every bottle that's labeled with the, with the same thing uh, has an identical composition or even batch to batch that's the same. So. Um, uh, the one thing that has uh, shown effect in slowing progression, but only after the disease has begun, is vitamin E. There are two, two large studies from, uh, from Mount Sinai that show that it can delay time to nursing home uh, placement or can reduce caregiver burden uh, in terms of hours per day. 
but it doesn't uh, prevent the disease from beginning. It only slows the progression once it's, it's begun. You probably will have heard of ginkgo, which was associated with Alzheimer's disease for many years. Uh, the NIH uh, recently did a large study in um, which they standardized all the pills. They made all the ginkgo extract. They made all of the extract, all the pills for the entire study up front, so they were all the same all throughout. No effect. Useless. So I should throw up my ginkgo biloba? Um, it won't uh, prevent you from getting Alzheimer's disease. But one thing that, uh, that I'm asked about a lot is turmeric and curc or curcumin. Um, a, a problem with, um, I mean, that's a, uh, there, there does seem to be an effect in terms of um, reducing uh, pathology in mouse models. So one thing we do in the laboratory before we ever get a, give a medicine to a, a person with Alzheimer's disease is that we can create mice with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, curcumin or turmeric does help those mice because in mice we can put it directly in the brain. It does not, the, the orally ingested um, turmeric doesn't get into the brain very well. So there are, there are now efforts to make a, a form of turmeric that you can put, make into a pill that will get into the brain uh, and, and may be useful. Certainly the anti-inflammatory uh, parts of that, that molecule look promising. And in fact, um, inflammation is probably one of the uh, sort of most, uh, sort of the hottest areas uh, in Alzheimer's uh, research right now. How about stress? Uh, how does that impact the disease or onset or not at all? Uh, it does. So the, the, um, st when, st when you're stressed, uh, you may uh, know that you se uh, secrete cortisol, this uh, 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 chemical from your, from your adrenal gland. Uh, that is toxic to nerve cells. Uh, in addition, the, sort of the, some of the factors upstream of, of the cortisol are also bad for the brain. So stress will uh, certainly uh, something to, to be avoided. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with Dr. Gandhi. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who, through leadership, skill, and dedication, is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harper. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator, and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Make journalism great again. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. 
The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. Welcome back to the show. This is part two of our two-part series with Dr. Sam Gandhi of the Icon School of Medicine. So, Sam, uh, let's talk about imaging. I know uh, a tremendous amount of studies are being done uh, thanks to brain imaging, uh, fMRIs and all. Uh, what's the state of imaging? How good is it? And what are your expectations in terms of improvements in both imaging and analysis of data? Well, in terms of making the initial diagnosis, MRI is, is essential. Uh, to rule out uh, re reversible causes of dementia. It's not that we see the, the signs of Alzheimer's, but sometimes thyroid disease, uh, obstruction of the uh, spinal fluid flow, uh, brain tumors can mimic Alzheimer's disease. And they obviously have a very different uh, treatment. But what, what's more characteristic is shrinkage of the brain, especially the area of the brain called the hippocampus. Which it, is but that's normal as you age. Uh, to some extent, but um, with Alzheimer's disease, the, the, the wasting, the atrophy is accelerated. So you, lost, you have more loss of brain substance, especially in the hippocampus. When does that start? Um, it starts before the disease begins. So by the time there are symptoms, there's usually some hippocampal wasting or, or atrophy. So that could be in your late 50s, early 60s, or? Um, probably 60s to 70s, I would say, yeah. And so uh, where do you expect, what kind of improvements uh, do you expect and or want when it comes to imaging and the analysis of that data? So, so the, the area that's really exploding is called molecular imaging, which are um, ways of PET, using the PET scan, positron emission tomography, to visualize the pathology or the, the, the uh, tissue changes. The first uh, tissue change, the first molecular imaging, was done with the amyloid plaque basically a chemical that had been used in pathology labs to stain plaques, was repurposed, uh, made radioactive, uh, infused, and binds to the amyloid plaques in the brain. And that's how we know about people who have symptoms but no plaques, because so, now... So with that injection, with that material in you, uh, adhering or binding to the plaques, uh, essentially then when you do a PET scan, they're lighting up big time. That's right. Uh, well, talk about that, but also, talk, I mean, a big difference in terms of uh, the radiation exposure one gets between a PET scan and an MRI. I mean, MRI, well, you're not getting any. There's no exposure. radiation with MRI. Right. Uh, but with but PET scans, you can. I mean, you do. What's your sense of uh, you know, the, 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 the significance of that? Usually two PET scans a year is as many as we would normally do. Maybe three uh, if essential, but no more than that. In because of the radiation. The, the, and is there anything on the horizon that could uh, achieve the same uh, information as a PET scan but not give you uh, that kind of dosage? There are attempts to bind metals to the same sort of chemical uh, and enable, to, uh, enable us to see those plaques with MRI. Those uh, studies have not really given uh, high resolution yet, but that may be what replaces the, uh, uh, the PET scan. There are two other PET scans that we're, that we're using, one other that are experimental. So the, the amyloid scans are approved by the FDA, but not reimbursable. So you can get one covered if you're in a clinical trial, but otherwise it's four or $5,000 out of pocket. Yeah, they're not cheap. No. Um, there are two other experimental scans to, to mention. The first are tau scans. It's now possible with a, with a different chemical, so it's the same process, infusion, and then uh, uh, scanning for radiation, where you can determine uh, the, the presence of tangles. Is that also a PET scan? It's also a PET scan. Okay. Um, and we're, when we're looking for diseases, uh, trying to sort of ca characterize it, <clears throat> when we're trying to, to separate, say, uh, Alzheimer's disease from CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, in people who've had repetitive head trauma, uh, we use both the amyloid scan and the, the, ta the tangle scan to distinguish that because they will have negative amyloid scans. The third type is, that's in, still in development is an, an in inflammation scan. That's to determine the amount of inflammation in the brain. It may help direct therapy. So the third type of scan uh, are, are 
The third type of, type of scan is the inflammation scan. That's a, a new uh, chemical that's sort of on the horizon, also a PET scan, but will hopefully tell what stage of inflammation the brain is in uh, when that person is being tested. You know, when it, when it comes to understanding the brain, how much do we really know about the brain? I mean, we've, we've, it seems we've been able to, to, to uh, just generate so much information, so much knowledge, but at the same time, it's, it seems like we've, in, in a certain respect, just begun to understand how the brain works and what we can do with it. So um, that, that's certainly true, both in terms of function of the brain and the, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Probably the, the most uh, progress that's been made recently is with big data. That is with looking at the uh, expression of, of the genes in regions of brains for people with Alzheimer's disease versus controls, looking at various regions and various stages of hundreds or thousands of brains and finding not just single molecules that change, but entire networks that move up and down. And we look for those networks and try and, and uh, cure the, the movement of those networks. So looking ahead uh, to the future in terms of, uh, we talked about this just briefly before, but not necessarily in relation to the brain, where uh, you have a, uh, a really a, a, an extraordinary opportunity in, in you know, a matter of decades where if you need a new liver, you'll be able to have one grown for you. If you need new eyes, you'll have, you know, whether it be retina, cornea, whatever you need, uh, eventually optic nerves, uh, et cetera, uh, grown for you out of your own tissue, where we're replacing so much of our, our bodies, where someone who uh, is 100 may have body parts that are literally uh, the equivalent of someone who's 20 or 30. Um, will, will, will people, it's kind of two questions, will, will people become immortal in a certain sense, living to, or, or you know, people living to 150 or 200? Uh, but with all of that, uh, how, what role will the brain play uh, in terms of our ability to, to keep it young, as it were? Uh, the challenge there is telling the, the transplanted tissue how to get reconnected with the brain. We're, we basically depend on the tissue to have its own messages about where it should be connected. And the challenge with Alzheimer's disease in particular is that the loss of brain substance uh, is the entire surface of the brain. And replacement is really difficult um, in terms of physical uh, intervention. And the, at the MCI stage, where mostly the problem is memory and in, in the hippocampus, we might be able to extend that period or delay conversion from MCI to, to dementia. But I don't think we're going to have a, a transplant an entire cortex uh, to, to sort of prevent people from getting Alzheimer's disease with, with that strategy. Or the, just I'm just thinking the ability of the brain to regulate all those functions with new tissue and new organs. Is that going to be a challenge? Well, certainly uh, if to connect new organs up to the regulatory system that's already present uh, is a challenge. Uh, some organs, you know, like kidney and uh, liver, have their own structure. They, the, the transplanted tissue either comes with structure or develops its own structure. And again, with the brain, uh, when that tissue is transplanted, we don't, have, don't really have any way of telling the brain, you know, there are new tissue, new, new organs there. It has to sort of figure that out uh, on its own by using the nerve cells that descend from the brain to the, to the, say, the, the abdomen. All right, well, hopefully neither of us are going to need any new organs anytime soon. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> anyway, Sam, thanks so much. Thank you. Great having you on the show. That was Dr. Sam Gandy. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Thank you.